What's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to the Crash Bang Boom podcast. Today's guest is drummer Matt Haig of Atlanta's own The Callous Dow Boys. Matt and I did a rundown from their set list, having recently completed a tour with Protest the Hero and Moontooth, where we got into the stories behind each song, as well as the challenges in learning the previous material, as well as some of his gear and a whole bunch of other stuff. Callous Dow Boy dates start in Europe January 18th. Get them while they're hot, y'all. Today's episode is sponsored by OneUpLoops.com. Drummer Carson Gannon and his team spent an incredible amount of time recording over 450,000 shaker, tambourine, and hi-hat loops at every possible tempo and multiple fields with incredible mics and outboard gear for you to pick and choose. It's organized for you to find exactly what you need with just a few clicks and everything feels and sounds incredible. You can sign up for free to check it out and gain full access to all 450,000 loops starting at just $6 a month. No download limits, whatever you want, whenever you want. New loops, one-shots, and drum breaks are being added weekly. Definitely a killer addition to the arsenal of any drummer and or producer, mixer, engineer, you name it. Gotta switch up that monotonous click track shit. Check it out at oneuploops.com. Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found where all podcasts are found, including Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and more, just to name a few. If you like what you hear, please check out the previous 280 plus episodes and give me a like and or a positive review if you could. I would appreciate it. All right, let's do this thing already. Matt Haig, Callous Dow Boys, Crash Bang Boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Give, give, give the drum a yes! All right, I'm here with Matt Haig of the Callous Dow Boys, uh, primarily out of Atlanta. I believe you're in Philly. Matt, what's happening, man? Hey, man. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. I love getting to talk drums, and I, I never get to talk drums, so I'm excited. Well, you came to the right place, man. Uh, I recently saw you when you came through Atlanta. Uh, Y'all were on the tour with uh, Protest the Hero and my buddies in Moontooth. I've interviewed Ray, the drummer of Moontooth, a couple times. Uh, he's a friend uh, from New York days. And uh, how was that tour for you, man? Uh, it was awesome. It was like, um, I've been a big Protest the Hero fan since I was a kid. And like, I, it was just so cool to get to go out with a band that like had a big influence on me. Mm -hmm. And at, as a drummer, like it was, it was awesome. <laughs> I mean, like Ray from Moontooth is phenomenal. Like he's just the man and uh the touring drummer of protests is a guy named uh matt they call him hk and he was just unbelievable too it was it was such an awesome experience to get to be around other great drummers like that and yeah it was it was a long one we were out there for like a month and a half yeah people dressed up for halloween every day even after halloween ended it was awesome it was cool <laughs> Nice. Uh, everybody had some wild looks on on stage that night, man. It was it was a fun night for sure. Lots of high energy and just the crowd was into it. It just seemed like a good night. It was a good time. Absolutely. Getting anytime I get to play Atlanta with the Callous Dow Boys is just total chaos. Yeah, it is. It's the most fun shows I've ever played. Nice, man. Uh, well, what's your story with, uh, you know, actually getting the gig? And I mean, when did you join the band? Um, yeah, I joined the band. Last year, we started talking and making plans around January, and then I played my first show in May. So from January to, to May was just like the Rocky Four training montage right. of learning how to play the Callous Dow Boys songs. Yeah, right. Uh, to talk about getting the gig. You know, I was a, a fill-in uh, touring drummer for a couple years. I, I like, long story short, I built up an Instagram profile of me playing uh, covers of like everything from hardcore to like pop songs and just like uh, I put out a lot of videos and the whole time I I like advertised hey like I'll do this for you if you need a drummer hit me mm -hmm. up you know that led to a couple gigs and eventually uh, my name got around to Carson the singer of the Dow Boys and he sent me an Instagram DM like hey man we're looking for a drummer um, are you interested it seems like you you'd be a good fit and uh, he specifically cited like a From Autumn to Ashes drum cover that I posted <laughs> that where he saw that and was like, all right, yeah, this guy can do it. Nice. So anyway, yeah. So um, that was around January. You know, it took me six months to be able to learn how to play the songs on Celebrity Therapist. They were they completely blew my mind. Yeah. I was already a fan of them when they hit me up and I didn't know they had a new record coming and getting to hear it. I was like, there's. 
I've never heard anything like this. It's so cool. Right. But yeah, and then uh, I've been touring with them ever since. So that is a quick summary of how I got the gig. <laughs> I've talked about it before when you have to learn a back catalog and acclimate yourself to the band and sort of what preceded you, you sort of inevitably end up uh, is sort of with some of the other previous styles sort of ingrained in your own plan and how you approach orchestrating the drums and then come time to record it. There's some of those correlations. So I guess what was your experience when it came time to actually like go in and record those songs? Like when it came time to record, I had been in the band for the better part of a year. You know, we started working on God Smiles Upon in December of 2022, that's when Carson first started sending us demos and being like, this is what, this is the plan, you know, we're mm. going to do three songs and we're going to show people what we're about now and like kind of change the sound a little bit. And this is where we want to go with it. So it was about six months of writing and, and, you know, in that time we were on tour too. So I would go down to Atlanta and like, me, Carson and Dan would sit in a room and work on demos and like I would, I would be there for the writing process and it was it was really inspiring it was really cool um it's like a become like a defined era in my mind now when I think about the band for but sure getting to to physically write the music uh the drums for this like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> I just really wanted to push myself because like I said when they sent me celebrity therapist like I couldn't believe I was like, I've never heard anything like this before. Like, like yeah. who the hell are these guys? And then to get to be part of what comes after that, like I have an E kit in my house. Like I have an Elisa's Crimson two, which I love. And I run these get good samples mm -hmm. through it. And like, that's where I do all my rehearsing. Like, uh -huh. I don't have space to play like acoustic kit where I live at. Right. So everything I do takes place in a corner of my apartment on my E drums. And like, I just would sit there for four hours a day. And I would and just just play the drums. They sent me some guitar pro tabs where I could like physically watch what was happening on the guitar while I was writing. And that changed everything. Interesting. It was so helpful. Because the process of learning something mathy for me would be slow it down until it barely sounds like music anymore. Uh -huh. and just learn it beat by beat. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is work. Fucking oh tedious. God. Yeah. Dude, it's it's terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, but that's the only way, you know. You you have to you have to just learn it in your muscles first, I think. But anyway, right. when they sent me the guitar profiles and I could see what was happening, like I could read the measures, like okay, here we go from four four to seven, back to five to four, like or whatever weird stuff we're doing, <laughs> made the writing process so much faster. Right. And. The only other really fun memory I have from really writing stuff is I remember Carson called me because I'd sent him a video update, like here's where I'm at with the song, what I'm what I'm working on and stuff, and he gave me a phone call and was like, "You gotta be crazier." He <laughs> <laughs> was like, "I need you to just like go nuts at some of these parts." Wow. Yeah, it was fun. We recorded down in Atlanta with uh, our buddy Dom Maduro. I think he did like the first two Dow Boys EPs. Okay. If I remember correctly, he did like my Dixie wrecked, and I... <laughs> still every every time every time I hear that, I mean, I, I just I can't help but laugh at a good dick joke. I know. <laughs> 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 they're they're such a funny band. I guess I have I I always catch myself saying they because I still feel so new to it. But anyway, uh, recording down in Atlanta was cool, man. I like I I feel like a guy who's had a ton of touring experience. And I have not gotten to record much at all. And it's right. something that something that I really feel like I'm missing, like in my playing. Like I want more time in the studio, mm -hmm. like mic'd up, getting to try stuff. So it was it was fun to just go in there and see what we could do. And we we tracked the drums in two days. Nice. Yeah, we did two songs the first day. I think the second day we just finished out the third track, Designer Shroud of Turin. Yeah. Because it's it was a lot. <laughs> right. That was a lot to pack. Did you have most of your parts pretty much locked down? Like what percentage of the parts would you say you were pretty much locked down? And then you did you leave some for to figure out in the studio? Or were you like, fuck it, I don't even know? 100% locked in, dude. Yeah. I went in there just like, <laughs> <laughs> I went in there with a plan. Like I saw ones and zeros when I was recording. I hear you. Which is something that, that kind of bums me out a little bit when I listen to it. Because like, uh, you know, everyone's their own harshest critic. And when I hear the EP now, some parts I'm like, 
I could have turned it up a notch. I could have went for it, you know, in this breakdown or with this fill. But like getting the follow up celebrity therapist, I was just like nervous and like I think I caught up and wanted to do a good job, you know, right. wanting to wanting to show that I could I could keep up with with what they were writing. Yeah. Maintaining your anxiety within this pressure of a studio and everybody watching and critiquing and putting a magnifying glass on your plan is, uh, it can be hard to manage that. So like you can come in as prepared as you want, but I, I hear what you're saying. Sometimes you're like, I should have been maybe a little bit more open in the moment to, to maybe alter something right there that would have been cooler and more in the moment. But it's hard to do that when you know that that's, there's going to be all this pressure on that. I mean, I guess you put it on yourself. You can manage it somehow. I've always struggled to manage it. I have my own studio behind me now, and I still, I'm in my head, I'm like, there's no one here listening to me. Why am I having anxiety about recording these fucking drums right now? And I still get it. Totally. No, and I mean, like, I don't know about you, but for me, like, I'm scared of the click track. Okay. Because it's 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 never wrong, you know. Right. So I get in the studio and I I hear the I hear the click and I'm like I can't fuck around, <laughs> you know. I get nervous. <laughs> um, but you know, kind of jumping back to to the protest the hero tour, like I got bored playing those songs like the same way. The songs uh-huh. are still fun and they're they're crazy every night, but like I I was. I was so binary with everything. I was like, these are the parts, you know, and we're on ears. We, I play to a click live. Right. So again, I was like, I got to stay tight. And, but halfway through that tour, I was like, I was like, no, nah, I'm going to switch it up. I started with star baby. Cause it was the first song. And I was like, I'm going to go for a blush to fill right here. Right. I did not nail it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was bad. And then the next night I was like, I'm going to try it again. And it went a little better, you know? Nice. We're, we're kind of working on new stuff now. It's very early stages, but like one thing I'm keeping in mind is like, when we go in the studio again, like I'm just going to try shit. And if they got to quantize me a little bit, I, I'll let it happen. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's good. It takes a little bit of the pressure off that you're otherwise yeah. applying to you freaking out about being perfectly metronomic. And I mean, most of the albums totally. that you hear today that sound perfectly metronomic have likely been very much put on a grid and quantized. Absolutely, man. And like, I don't know, I, tr- I try to look to like what other drummers in, in a similar style have done. And like, I remember reading John Theodore talking about doing, I think, the second or third Mars Volta record. And, uh-huh. and he was like, every album I would just go in and, you know, play whatever I wanted, let the ideas flow through me. But then on this record, you know, I went in and just played it straight for the first time ever. And I'm like, how are you in the Mars Volta just going at it, man? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, you know, if there's if maybe that's what it takes to play this kind of music, you know, you got to be a little more open to these things. And right. I don't know. I'm going to give it a shot, you know, and yeah. not be so scared of the quick track. I'll embrace it this time. Around. Another thing about John Theodore that I read some time ago, I believe in Modern Drummer, maybe one of the first articles that he was in around the first or second record or so. He said another thing about click tracks where he said he just imagines a cool guy with sunglasses leaning up against the wall, like playing a cowbell. You're just playing with your buddy. I mean, I'm, para- I'm, awesome. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I've remembered it to this day and I try to remind myself of that. But then I'm like, oh, God damn it. You know, so I try to make it not, first of all, an obnoxious sound to the click track. Sometimes they get real pitchy and obnoxious. Oh, I yeah. Try to get them either close to like a snare sound or a deeper cowbell but, and then maybe just turn it up so I'm not losing it in the mix. But something that, first of all, the tonality of it isn't just fucking monotonous and totally distracting. You know? Oh, for sure. That's the nice thing about modern production is you can you can go into the details so much as to choose your own click track noise. Were you ever in a band with a guy who would uh, send you demos and the click track noise was a hi hat? Oh, oh, I, I I almost quit the band. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was I was like, dude, I play the hi hat. You right. can't make me hear it the whole time. <laughs> I'm playing the hi hat throughout this whole fucking thing. Oh, man, that's funny. Well, you mentioned uh, Star Baby. I guess let's go through a little bit of the set list. I'd be interested in hearing sort of your take on hearing uh, or your take on learning some of the other songs. So I'll just kind of rattle off some of the set list. Um, And uh, the most recent one that I saw, uh, I'll just give you the rundown, was Star Baby, Violent Astrology, Pushing the Pink Envelope, Waco Jesus, What is Delicious, Who Swarms, Title Track, Blackberry, DeLorean, and Fake Dinosaur Bones. 
But let's yep. let's start with Star Baby and sort of your uh, your your experience in learning that track. Aside from what sounded like you fucked it up uh, at one time, was that the, <laughs> was that the song you mentioned, the opening song? Oh yeah, that yeah. was the first one where I was like, I'm just gonna try stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Star Baby was the first Style Boy song that I was even like able to play, and. You know, a lot of it's in 4-4, a lot of it's that fun disco beat, and the Matthew parts are still tricky, but I don't know. It was It's something I was able to, like, sit down, s- slow the song down, and count out, and then when, I, when we play it live, it is, like, it's just so much fun. I'm probably going to tell you all of these songs are fun. <laughs> good. <laughs> I'm just That's gonna good. That's good. All out right. Out of the way now. <laughs> yeah. But, like, learning that one was nowhere as as time consuming as the rest of the songs it's it's really gratifying to be able to play though i've started uh changing up the you know the, the jazzy poppy end part and like making it putting more triplets into the ride and like, uh-huh. experimenting with the fills more just trying to get the song to to move a little bit when i play it now mm-hmm. that one's a blast i don't know i never thought i would get to be in a band where we, we scream the words methamphetamine Right. <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> What about the second track, Violent Astrology? This one was the hardest Dow Boys song to learn. <laughs> okay. This one, oh my God. And you know, it's the first song on Celebrity Therapist. And when they sent me the record, I was like, I'm just gonna learn the album front to back. Bad idea. Right. It was it's it's chaos. <laughs> and um, you know, I'm I'm buddies with a, an amazing drummer, Travis Orban. I've taken a lesson from Travis. I've taken lessons from Travis, man. <laughs> nice. Yeah, fuck yeah, he's, he's amazing. He's the fucking man. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. He's insane, dude. I swear to God, as soon as the Calistyle Boys hit me up, I I texted Travis and I was like, I need to book a lesson with you right now, man. You got to help me. <laughs> <laughs> nice, good. <laughs> and you know, uh, and this and Violent Astrology was the song that I sent to Travis Orban, and I was like, What the hell is going on here, dude? What the fuck is this? Yeah, and he he replied with like some guitar pro tabs of like the crazy hertas in the opening. Right, you know he was like, "This is what this is." Also, this song rocks. So we got the Travis Orban seal. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> um, yeah, man, learning this one was like, but I looked at it as like I'm gonna do. I'm gonna learn it in parts. You know, I started out real simple, just trying to nail where the snare hits are, and then I would build. You know, I would add in more double kick. I would add in cymbal, um, accents, stuff like that. Like some of these crazy math core patterns are just, they're nuts. <laughs> totally. I, I hear you. This one was such a challenge. And it was a song we were all really scared to play live. We, we were like, no one knows how we're going to do this. <laughs> right, right. But now it's our favorite one. Like everyone agrees, like Violent Astrology is like just the, the, best song of the set every single night that's awesome and you did it yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> it appears like the third and fourth song in the set were the songs that uh you recorded in pushing the pink envelope and waco jesus but i guess how was it then playing those live you kind of touched earlier on maybe switching some things up live as you played it more and more did you kind of experience that with your own parts in those songs live yeah, a little bit. I, I kind of like I mess around a little bit with some of the fills and stuff. But the biggest difference for me is like getting to play songs that I like actually wrote, like as opposed to learning another drummer's parts and yeah. kind of making it my own. Like it just feels so much more natural. Absolutely. It does. Like those like the new songs feel like riding a bike on right. stage. And the old songs are like I'm thinking I'm putting myself in someone else's mindset. But like, right. I don't know. They just they flow out of me so much better when I get to play the new stuff live. And it's I don't know, it's it's really fun. It's been cool to like get to tackle this like weird kind of heavy music with like some of my own influences, you know, like I grew up wanting to play like like Aaron Gillespie or like whatever drummer was currently in every time I die. Right. There was a lot of different ones. I know there's <laughs> I've like, interviewed almost all of them. Yeah, I hear you. Oh, dude, who's yeah. your who's your guy? Man, I really like all of them. I I know that sounds like kind of a cop out. I I like Daniel. I like Legs. I thought Goose sounded great on that last record. You know, totally. I, I I don't know that I could say that I preferred one. I thought they all sounded great on each individual record. So I I don't even I don't know, man. 
I don't know. That's fair. I think there's no wrong answer, but I will say that I I am a Legs fan. The yeah. two Legs albums are unbelievable. Yeah, They're he, so does, sick. he does definitely shreds big time on that. <laughs> okay, so then I guess uh, fourth track or fifth track rather. What is Delicious? Who swarms? What is Delicious is fun, man. It's such a cool, like, weird song, and it's, like, one of the first Dow Boy songs I got to play that has, like, like big poppy parts in it, which, like, I don't know. It's it's cool to switch feels between, like, like what is a deathcore breakdown right before, like, a, a full-on, like, in sync style chorus. Yeah, right? Totally. <laughs> it's, it's so cool. That song's awesome. I've really experimented with the fills in that one like there's a lot of inverted doubles in the opening in between like the big stabs you know Mm -hmm. i just move them around the toms i love doing combinations of like snare rack rack snare like you get this weird like falling down the stairs kind of thing right there's a cool like old bonham fill where he would like cross over oh yeah yeah cross over his tom arms i do that every night just because it's it's a show off and absolutely looks cool (laughs) it's and it's awesome um (laughs) Yeah, and I don't know. I just I try to go a little crazy with with those inverted doubles. But yeah, that one's that one's a lot of fun. Nice. There's a lot of drum nerd stuff in that song. Excellent, man. What about Blackberry DeLorean? Dude, Blackberry DeLorean is the only is like it's it's a song that grooves in a way that other Dow Boys songs do not. And uh-huh. I have added like so many hi hat triplets to the first verse of that groove. Like I it's embarrassing. They should they should be telling me to to, to back off a little bit. Like, I just love how that one grooves, man. Nice. And like, uh, oh, one thing I will add is that when we play that song live, we add we add an extra breakdown to the end of it. And like, we've experimented. Like, um, we used to play in a mirror breakdown <laughs> at oh, really? the end of the song, okay. which I love a mirror. It was awesome. Anyway. Now we add, we just do another slow deathcore breakdown, and I, uh, I do, I think thirty second notes on the kick just as fast as I can. I taught myself how to swivel just to be able to play nice, just like rolling double bass on stage. Nice, dude. Yeah, Blackberry, Blackberry is, it's awesome. We made it something stupid. Nice, dude. Uh, last song, and then I mean, I guess at this point, at least in regards to this last uh run that y'all did, fake dinosaur bones. I'm assuming you're like breathing a little bit good, knowing that you're at the end of the race. You just got to finish the race at this point. Yes, <laughs> fake dinosaur <laughs> bones is like it's it's a victory lap. You know, it's just like sometimes I feel like they're they're a little tired of it. You know, to them it's like it's like playing Q without the E or playing like you know just the, it's like oh it's the big like we're every night we don't even practice it you know right but i love it i think it's so much fun and uh the only thing i really want to say about that is i i i I switched from doing one of those kind of d beats to playing uh a groove i stole from aaron gillespie from the first song off of lost in the sound of separation okay like weird uh polyrhythm that he plays with the the offset like hi-hat accents nice um I threw that into fake dinosaur bones because I think it's the most fun groove in the world. And (laughs) I love Aaron. I think he's a genius and like, he's such a big influence on me and yeah, man, that song, that song kicks ass as a Dow boys fan. That one rocks. Nice. Nice, man. Sort of speaking about slowing stuff down and learning it, the the tedious manner of doing so, especially with kind of complicated music. Uh, I was looking at some of your Instagram videos and you're wearing a Dillinger escape plan uh, hoodie. And I was like, okay, I'm assuming, I'm assuming he's a fan. And I I can hear some of those influences in, in the callous Dow boys and some of the, the parts, the drum parts, et cetera. Uh, Did you sort of do that same process and slowing it down learning? And did you, were you able to do that with Dillinger songs and or did you are you just a fan and you kind of learn what you could from them and that's what it is i would be scared to try to learn some dillinger songs man and i'm such a big fan like and i you know they have different eras with different drummers and different members and stuff but like i'm huge billy reimer fan i think he's the fucking man and like i don't know even even tackling some of that stuff which is a lot less chaotic than even you know an album like calculating infinity like i don't know dillinger to me or they're the goats. They are Meshuggah. You know, they're just, they're crazy. Um, totally. But, you know, the first time I went into a studio was like in, in North Jersey with a guy named Jesse Cannon. And like, I don't, I don't remember if he worked on 
calculating infinity or if he was just like around the scene at that time because jesse's like an old school guy he's he's like been recording since the 90s anyway he told my my band a story where he was like when the dillinger escape plan went to do their first record they had to record it on tape so they went in the studio for six months and practiced and learned everything as slow as they possibly could and then they got together and they recorded calculating infinity in the same room on tape i don't know if that's true jesus but <laughs> that stuck with me forever you know and then you know it, and when i took those lessons with travis that's the thing he told me. He was like, dude, slow it down. Slow it all down. He was like, even in, if you listen to a song in YouTube, pull up their settings, drag the song down to like 75 or 50%. Right. And like, you know, that's just how you learn stuff. Wow. Um, so I really do believe that like everybody, that's something that everyone should get into. Something I, I teach drums a little bit now and something I tell all my students is like slowing it down is a good way to ingrain that into your body. And you see if you're, reading the music while you're playing it you can see it happening you can feel it happening i really believe in slowing it down <laughs> <That's> <laughs> sorry the moral for the, of the story you know. sorry for the long-winded answer but i think dillinger does the same thing i know the dow boys do it you want to play weird music you got to play it slow at first fair enough man uh so considering like the drum sound of the previous records and again you know it's one thing to learn the songs it's another thing to be like kind of try to find gear that maybe sounds like it would fit into you know the band presently and do justice to some of the previous stuff for playing live what kit and or snare cymbals etc did you find uh worked for you in the live environment i've done a big cymbal upgrade since i joined the band and now i'm pretty much playing almost it's all zildjian and uh, it's a mix of A and K custom. Nice. And like, dude, for live, I think those K customs sound so good. I know everybody wants to keep them in the studio so they don't break. But like, come, dude, they sound so good in the room. Oh, my God. <laughs> I got, I just recently got, um, I think it's a 20-inch K custom suite crash for my left side. Nice. And it is like, it's, it's almost too much crash. It yeah. is so nice. Awesome. It, it sounds so good, dude. Sweet. Um, for snares, I I have a Gretsch Brooklyn series fourteen inch. Yep. That I I love the it's aluminum. Just, it's wood. Oh, okay. I I think it's wood. I might be aluminum, dude. I'm I, I have such a bad memory with this kind of stuff. <laughs> but like Gretsch makes like a uh, a nickel over brass. Oh yeah. That I think is gonna be my studio snare. For the next album i would recommend it i've got uh five brass snares and it's i've got three of which are nickel over some of the other ones are like you know just chrome over Ooh. but i've got yeah a brass is nice. brass is my whole that's the whole thing other than my superphonics my 70s like and the, and the acrylite uh, literally i think all the other ones are all brass yeah no i i honestly kind of think brass is the way to go to i had a bad experience with a brass snare i i don't know if I want to say the name of the company who made it. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> man, man, I could never get it to sound good. Huh. But, yeah, and I, I you know, I, it could just be user error. I've I've talked to some buddies who were like, no, nah, that snare stinks. So after that, you know, I got the Gretsch. I was like, I'm going to get something wood. And it's it's cool. I like it a lot. Tuning is like, oh, my God. Tuning is a thing that I wish I was so much better. I think everybody does. Right. But man tuning drives me crazy and you know having that bad snare for a couple of years i was like do i suck at this let me try something different but the the nickel over brass i i going to sound crazy nice i said what about the you, you know the uh the, the kit more or less that you that you played live uh it's another gretch i really i i love them i think they're so good i got a i play a marquee series and from what i understand it's like the same specs and like wood i believe it's maple as like one of their nicer series but they discontinued the marquee i don't know the whole story but i got it for dirt cheap nice out of sam ash there you <laughs> go I, I think it sounds awesome man like i don't know i if i was gonna upgrade i think i would get another gretch like i i think they sound amazing you know yeah man uh when i when i think about the sort of eclectic nature of the cows Dow boys music and sort of the 
some of the humorous aspects of the song titles, lyrics, the you know themes, etc. It seems like it's a, a an interesting assemblage of peculiar characters that then sort of filters its way out into the music. What has been your experience, sort of navigating like the the characters of the band as the new guy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, I I've never felt so at home in a band, and I think it's because they're all they're all freaks like me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, And like, I just, I, you know, I used to joke and be like, I, I feel like I made these guys up in my mind to have like new friends, but like nice Carson and I have the same type of crazy, whatever it is, we've both got it. Okay. We made a shirt that, um, <laughs> on the sleeve, it said Google synthetic caffeine, which is like some crazy, crazy conspiracy theory that he and I talked about like the day we met. It is so obscure and like no one knows what we're talking about, but now like hundreds of kids walk around with that on their arm. It's it's hilarious. And like I love that they they are like the same people in in, in the songs and like in person, you know? Like yeah. that weird, goofy, fun energy, like it comes across, I think, if you're just around us. Like we're all we're all weird. Yeah, man. Maddie, our guitar player, is a little stinker. Like, if you meet her within five minutes, she'll be like pointing to a stain on your shirt so she can flick your nose. It's oh, like boy. being in the Three Stooges. <laughs> <laughs> that is wild. What about uh, if you're in Philly, man? What is it like for you? I guess getting to Atlanta. Are you flying? Are you driving? And how frequently do you have to do that? Is you just go before a tour, or when you have to write, essentially? Yeah, I mean. Um, you know, I, so I've always, like I said at the beginning of, I've, I've always kind of been like a fill-in guy. And, yep. um, this is like the third or fourth band that I've worked with that I've had to travel for. Cause like, you know, living where I do, like it's, it's not exactly a hub for, for music the way somewhere like Atlanta is, but mm -hmm. like, so it is a lot of flying. It's a lot of traveling, which, um, I hate being at the airport it makes me feel like cattle, right? You know, you're just getting shepherded in the line all day, <laughs> yeah. but I don't know, man. Usually if there's new songs in the set, to rehearse i'll go down a couple days early and we'll do that and then we just all leave together one time i i drove a van that we were renting down to atlanta and then drove it back after the tour so it all really depends but um yeah the traveling aspect is really cool i i like getting to work with people from all over the country you know i used to play for a band that was out of idaho oh damn yeah and atlanta's a lot <laughs> a lot closer than that is, you know? <laughs> yeah, it is. I lived in Utah, so I would go to Idaho every now and again. And yeah, it's it gets pretty remote up there. I mean, it could be, sure, man. It could be really beautiful, but it's definitely, you feel isolated from the rest of the country, certainly the coasts. And it's it's weird. It's yeah, like absolutely. not the Southwest. It, it's not the Midwest. It's like the kind of maybe Northern Southwest Central. I, oh, yeah. I don't even know what like Utah and Idaho are considered to be necessarily. They're not, it's clearly not the West coast no I absolutely mean, i don't know what the fuck they are i even lived there you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's a strange place for sure man i'm not very tall i'm like five seven and i went to idaho and everybody's mormon and they're seven foot eight right and i'm like you guys are freaks genetic freaks <laughs> yeah the women are, are like super portly and then they've got yeah. like <laughs> six to eight to ten waspy children running around with their little blonde hair. And not only do, do, do the men always look gay, but also look like they're on steroids. So they look like the super like buff gays. And then they, again, they the portly wives and all the children <laughs> running around. I was like, what the fuck? And then I, I figured out, oh, those those are Mormons because Salt Lake City is a little more mixed. But the second you leave Salt Lake City, it's like Mormon central. Oh, yeah. I can identify them more often than not by those characteristics. It is Sarsville, <laughs> dude. <laughs> dude, no, I mean, like, I I feel like people in bands always joke about having to play Salt Lake City because everyone's just like, what, what is going on with you guys out here? <laughs> Whatever's in that lake, you shouldn't breathe it in. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> I, my wife and I and our children had never been so sick for the, the, the we I lived there a year it, and a half. We were never so sick in our lives. We were not sick prior to that, nor since we left. We were sick all the fucking time there. Dude, I hear you. It's it is a weird place. Uh props to you for giving it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> totally, man. It was a bizarre year and a half, I can assure you that. Tell me what's going on for 2024, man. New year, new you. Kind of fairly <laughs> fairly new band, new new adventures. Yeah, I mean, it's all Dow Boys from now on, you know? Like it's which is cool. And uh in I think 2 weeks we're flying to Europe. The tour with Tesseract and Unprocessed, which is going to be so cool. Nice. I cannot wait. 
And then we get home. There's some other stuff I can't talk about yet. Okay. Uh, that'll get announced soon. And then we got some tours in the works. We're gonna we're gonna record a new album. Hopefully, you know, we'll see. Uh, awesome. We're going back to the UK for download in the summer. We we have those two Dillinger Escape Plan shows, which feels crazy to say out loud. Right. I saw. Oh, that's right. I saw that. I, yeah, because they just announced it like a f- couple weeks ago. They were doing the tw- what twenty fifth anniversary of Calculating Infinity. Yeah, dude. Wow. I I can't believe it. That's. I awesome. never got to see Dillinger when they were a band, and I was such a big fan. I just like somehow I always miss them, and like I don't know. I I love Calculating, so I'm really excited to see it. I saw the original lineup up through their last show. Uh, at let's the, go. At, yeah, so I saw them fifteen times. So. Yeah, Dude, yeah, that's amazing. You're gonna have a good time. It's gonna be it's gonna be crazy. To this day, it's like I I don't understand how those guys physically, mentally, and emotionally have been able to, especially Ben. You know, I talked about that recently, but like, it Ben he's just a uh, some sort of superhero. I don't know how he's done it and continues to do it. It's amazing. For sure, man. Yeah, what a band. I'm so happy they're that they're doing anything. Absolutely. And like I we we just did two shows with um Billy Reimer's new band Thought Crimes. Right. And like. Oh man, I talked his ear off. I bet. I, I shook his hand and I was like, with the calculating infinity. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Well, uh, Matt, thanks for rapping, dude. Uh, it's been fun to talk to you about it. I dig the band. It was great seeing y'all when you came through in Atlanta. And uh, it sounds like you got a, a good 2024 ahead of you. So best of luck in the uh, new year. And uh, we'll have to catch up soon, dude. Dude, thank you so much. I would love to be back. Thank you for having me. I love talking drums. Absolutely, man. <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Matt for catching up and talking about all the songs as well as the importance of slowing it down in an effort to learn some spastic shit sometimes. Hope you all enjoyed it. Catch you on the next one. Crash, bang, boom!